a lineup of speakers. And this tr makes a perfect transition to the next panel that we have, which is talking about how are we going to pay for the SDGs? Where are these $2.5 trillion a year that we've been talking about going to come from? And I hope we also do tackle the word belief, which has been at the core of what we've just been talking about now. And um, towards the end, I want to tell you about belief in, in projects, especially my experience working with electric cars, with the new Formula One. I'll come to that at the end of the session. But yes, now the next panel, we're going to talk about who is going to pay for all these global goals. And it's time to hear for the people that turn billions into trillions. We have three of them here, absolutely, <laughs> in making the money sign. But first, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Samantha Attridge, Senior Research Fellow at the Overseas Development Institute from London. Thank you so much for coming to Istanbul. Thank you. Pleasure. Take a seat. Oh, OK. It's grown. See, the billions are, are turning into trillions as we speak. Um, I'll introduce the ones that I have, and if there's any missing, you, we'll, we'll introduce them then. Gail Clintsworth, Business Transformation Director from Business Sustainable, De Sustainable Development Commission in the UK. Welcome. Hi, welcome. Take a seat. Thank you. Josh Verbeek, Special Representative to the UN and the WTO from the World Bank Group. He was making the money sign, so I'm sure you have a lot to say. hope so. Thank you. Welcome. Matteo Rivellini, who I've been sitting to, next to throughout the day. Welcome. He is the EIB Head of Division, Public Sector Operation, covering Slovenia, Croatia, and the Western Balkans. Nice to see you. And Lucia Atenosi, Senior Economist from the Council of Europe Development Bank. Hello, Lucia. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're all set. Excellent. And after this is the coffee break, so do stay put. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we've come to the exciting part of the afternoon. I don't know if we can follow that session uh, to talk about financing and moving, uh, shifting the needle from billions to trillions. I think we've all heard that expression a lot in the last few years. So today we're going to talk about where's the money going to come from? How are we going to fund this? And specifically for this panel, we're going to look and talk about the role of the international financial institutions uh, so it's specifically focused on, on the role in shifting that needle. Um, I'd say this morning, actually, I think Marcus uh, did a, quite a nice scene setting. Um, he told us about the vast financing needs we had. He quoted 1.9 billion to 3.1 billion per annum, estimated by UNCTAD. He also outlined the economic opportunity uh, presented by the SDGs for the private sector of about 12, did, uh, 12 trillion dollars. Um, and that money wasn't the problem. But actually, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if it is the problem, but what we do know is that the money isn't flowing. And one figure that wasn't quoted, for example, was um, institutional investors currently sit on almost $10 trillion worth of assets that are negative yielding assets. And so there's a little bit of a mismatch in the global finance system between the supply of finance and where it's invested and, and, and allocated. Um, so, as I say, the question I think that we're facing, and I, I want to ask this panel, is how do we incentivize and reorientate these investment flows into investment into sustainable development? It can't be business as usual. We've heard that a lot today. And that fundamental change is required. It's a collective es effort. It's not the public sector, kind of, and then the private sector. It's a collective effort. Um, so it's both public and private, but it's also that the national level that the systems, it's the international level and it's the regional level. So it's a holistic collective effort that we need. And I believe that there's fundamental change that is required. And we're going to probe that um, this afternoon with the institutions represented on the panel. We also heard earlier about a paradigm shift. As we saw with the MDDs to the SDGs, we see one in finance. And what do I mean by that? What we've seen now is a movement away from 
if you like, the aid effectiveness agenda and aid, really to one which is focused on how do we crowd in additional private finance using public resource and public policy, and also an emphasis on domestic revenue mobilization, and we spoke this morning about that. Um, so, what we want to know is, what's the role of the IFIs in this? Um, and I think about three years ago, the IFIs, I think we have one of the architects of the strategy here, uh, articulated their contribution to this shifting the needle from um, billions to trillions. And I think there were three areas um, um, where the MDB system could be focusing on and it's identified. That's around leveraging its resource. It's around um, technical assistance and policy guidance and importantly around improved coordination and alignment across the system. So anyway, enough from me. I'm delighted to have this wonderful panel and we've got a, a really good panel today um, with great expertise and different perspectives, I think. So I'm hoping to probe them. They've already said I can probe them and ask them some difficult questions and I'm asking the audience as well, if anything, uh, feel free to ask, put them on the spot and ask difficult questions as well. Um, so, I have two representatives from the multilateral de development banks. We have Joss Verbuck, as um, already introduced, from the World Bank Group, and Matteo Revellini from the EIB. And as they're important because they'll be able to talk to us about this billions to trillions strategy of the MDB system. And then in the same breath as we talk about private finance, often blended finance comes out. <laughs> and I'm delighted that we have Gail on the panel. Uh, who was involved in the Sustainable Business, uh, Sustainable Business Development Commission, who issued a really, really interesting report on scaling up blended finance in January, which is going to be uh, finalised and launched at the spring meetings. And it raises some really interesting observations and questions um, about the MDB system, which we can discuss with our colleagues. Um, and then finally, we have Lucia, who works for the... Council of Europe Development Bank, which is quite a unique institution with, which focuses exclusively on social investment. And I think this is quite interesting because when we talk about private finance and blended finance in particular, we see that it's heavily concentrated in the hard sectors of the economy. And so I think it'd be really interesting to get your perspective about how do we go about also um, incentivizing private investment in the more social sectors. So without further ado, um, we're going to have three rounds of questions um, with the panel. And the first uh, set of questions I'd like to ask, and maybe I'll start with uh, Ulysses here, is basically, with this billions to trillions agenda, uh, if you like, which started around 2015 with the adoption of the 2030 agenda, what top two kind of changes do you see have been made in terms of shifting this needle? Or what, what's been put in place, the foundations? Okay, one thing I should say before I start that we did not actually sign the from billions to trillions strategy, but it doesn't mean that we do not care. On the contrary, we do care a lot. In fact, our institution has a social mandate and we have therefore been paying close attention to the global agenda. And uh, especially since last year when we started working on how we as a small institution acting in Europe in social investment could assess our own contribution to SDGs. I will therefore address your question from our own perspective. At the CEB, the Council of Europe Development Bank, we have introduced two major changes. The first is strategic. We have updated our strategy to include climate action as one of our top priorities, along with our social mandate. Five years ago, our shareholders were reluctant for us to focus on climate change because our job was, concentrate, was to concentrate on our social mandate. But obviously with time, we have realized that the two aspects cannot and must not be separated. So today, we have a sector line of action dedicated to developing mitigation and adaptation measures in the context of climate change. And we do carry out environmental screening and impact assessment on all our social projects. The second change has been in terms of innovation in our financial instruments. Last year, we issued our first social inclusion bond. 
the proceeds from this bond finance project with high social quality in the sectors of social housing, education, and job creation in micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. And there has been very strong interest from the market in this instrument, and especially from a wide range of socially responsible investors. And we are very pleased about this because our idea is to create momentum in this segment and to bring the market around to our objective, which is to enhance social cohesion in Europe. And two weeks ago, we issued our second social inclusion bond. It was the same volume of 500 million euros. And the deal, again, attracted a lot, a lot of interest of high quality investors. And if I am talking about this instrument, because this particular instrument is directly close to several SDGs. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just for the ones uh, uh, who, who don't know the European Investment Bank, uh, the EIB is the bank of the uh, European Union member states uh, that uh, primarily invest in Europe, uh, however, also in other 130 countries in the world. Uh, the EIB finances uh, I infrastructure, uh, innovation, uh, climate adaptation projects, as well as SMEs. And just to give you an order of magnitude uh, of what we do uh, and how we contribute to these uh, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, uh, in 2017 only, we financed uh, 80 billion projects. Um, to bear in mind that when we say 80 billion, because we are additional, we are a crowding in bank, uh, we, are, we are additional to the, to the market, uh, that has meant that uh, the investments in, uh, in total that were carried out thanks to our investment uh, amounted to 250 billion euro uh, uh, only in 2017. 10% of this uh, amount was devoted to projects located uh, outside Europe. And this is one of the ways we contribute to the billion to trillion strategies, one of the way we contribute to the Agenda 2030 to which our shareholders have committed and to which the European Commission is also, uh, is also committed. Um, we also measure the impact of what we are doing. Uh, just to give you an example about, uh, again, 2017 figures, uh, we have uh, our, the estimate of the impact of our investments in SMEs, for example, <coughs> will produce uh, <coughs> something like 530,000 jobs. Uh, our investments in the health sector will produce the fact that uh, 130,000 people will be treated in new hospitals uh, uh, following the realization of the, of the, uh, inve on the, of the projects. All this to say that uh, we are contributing massively to these uh, uh, needs, uh, these financial needs that uh, are needed for the uh, objective, uh, in to, uh, for, to attain the objective in 2030. Uh, however, I want to use the opportunity here for having you know, a number of uh, representatives of public administration to say that yes, the investment needs are, the investment gap uh, is uh, huge, the resources are possibly there, the financial resources are possibly there. However, we all need to think about how to use better the financial resources that we have already. Uh, you know, when we have the issue of the scarcity of uh, energy sources, uh, we develop the concept of energy efficiency. Here, we have a scarcity of financial resources. We need to develop a concept of finance efficiency. And when I say finance efficiency, I really mean that uh, we need to make sure, and the burden is particularly on the public administrations, we need to make sure that when we're talking about infrastructures to be financed, are financed well and monies are, are well spent. I'm gonna give you, just to finish my first intervention, a few examples on, on how uh, uh, monies can be spent very badly. 
and these are all transport infrastructure, transport projects that uh, uh, occurred in the Balkans, and uh, I will not name them, but uh, the, the region I know best. Uh, so when a public administration has a scarcity of resource, it, it needs to make sure that the project is well chosen, number one. When I say well chosen, it means that if the all international financial institutions are telling you that uh, this project is not economically viable, then you should drop it. This is not happening all the time. You need to make sure that it's well prepared. When uh, it is about uh, a road that goes cross-border, before you start constructing it, uh, you need to make sure that the alignment is agreed with the other country, because you need to have to make another bypass to connect the two the two roads from the two countries. You need to make sure that number three is a well procured. You do not need to accept uh, an unreasonably low bidding uh, uh, offer because it might happen that because of vari variation order, you might end up in paying twice the amount of the projected cost. You need to make sure that uh, number four is uh, well constructed, particularly when there is a subcontracting entities working for it. If there is a project that say the bill of quantities, there is a number of, I mean, quantity of cement that needs to be used, also the subcontractors need to be committed to this type of uh, 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 engagement. And number five, you need to make sure that uh, the infrastructure is well maintained. If you see that the motorway company budget is fully devoted to the salaries of the headquarters and there are no tolls that are given to the maintenance cost, to the, to the expenditure for the, capital, uh, for, the, for the maintenance cost, you have a problem in, maintain, in maintaining for long term the asset. So just to conclude this first uh, intervention, more than thinking or in addition to thinking of additional resources, let's use better the available resources. Thank you. Not to prolong your intervention any further, what are the top two changes that the EIB have made in light of this, this agenda, new agenda? Well, this is like a, certainly one of the areas where we are uh, looking at with particular attention. We have uh, turned down uh, all these five projects I mentioned when we were requested to finance with uh, all the disappointment of the public authorities, we've, we've turned them down. Uh, but there is more than this. There is the problem of empowerment of public administration. There is a problem of uh, uh, increasing of the regulatory framework in the countries. There is a problem in one word, I'll come back to this, uh, of the strengthening the rule of law in these countries. Thank you very much. And Joss, from the World Bank's perspective? Well, I can uh, honestly say that uh, I'm not personally responsible for the title from billions uh, to trillions, but my institution certainly is. Uh, in, internally, we had a sort of a discussion about should we call it billions for trillions or should we call it billions to trillions? And I can tell you I was in the camp who said billions for trillions because I felt that if you look at the financing going around in, the, in development, you look at ODA, it's about 140, 145 billion dollars a year. Uh, our own institution uh, consisting out of IDA, IBRD and IFC and MIGA, the last one is our guaranteeing agency, we do about $65 billion a year. And then, of course, there's some double counting because some of IDA resources also count as, uh, as ODA. So if you look at the billions to trillions, because uh, I lost out in the, in the title uh, race uh, at the time, um, but of course, if you look at what the MDBs actually have to do, is that the MDBs actually, in particular also my institution, the World Bank, we have to move from a resource transfer type of mentality to a resource mobilization type of mentality. We cannot just do any more business as usual and do $65 billion a year without thinking how are we mobilizing private financial resources. Yeah? So I think that the, the paradigm shift that we have to have in the MDBs, and which is actually going on, and I will give you maybe two examples from what we're doing in the World Bank is that in a sense we, we have to start thinking about how do we get the private sector not just interested in creating jobs and growth and things like that, but how do we get the, particularly the private financial sector interested in financing development. Yeah. Now, in the bank we, we put two mechanisms uh, uh, together. Uh, one is what we call the so-called cascade. And what does the cascade mean for us? A, it means that when we are seeing a project in a country, 
And it's a priority project that the government and the bank have identified as an important project that needs to be financed and should be implemented. The first question we are supposed to ask, can this be financed by the private sector or do we need to use uh, uh, scarce public international financial resources from the World Bank for it? If the answer is no, then we need to, in a sense, help the government to mobilize these private sector resources. If the answer initially is no, uh, it's not possible to do this with private resources just the way it currently stands, this project, then we really have to think about can we do things through regulation or creating markets such that the private sector is actually interested in participating, financing or fully financing this project. If that's the case, then we are being asked within our institution to work with government officials to put these markets and regulations in place so that actually the private sector can participate in financing of these projects. Uh, you could, for example, think about uh, that uh, land ownership is not possible for uh, a private sector in a certain countries. How do you then arrange that you put a road in place by which potentially you want that road ownership still to be with the private sector? Yeah. How are you going to arrange regulations and create a market that, that actually that land can be treated as, as if it's owned by the private sector who's building the road on it? Yeah. And then, of course, also we have to ask ourselves, is, will, is the private sector not coming into your country to finance the, this particular project because it's too risky? What type of risks are out there? Is it a financial risk? Is it a political risk? And how are we actually then going to de-risk that project? Do we just need to put in place political insurance? Then we have MIGA. Can we do that through some type of first loss uh, perspective uh, principles or through blended finance? If that's the case, then again, we are going in and we maybe have put some of our financial resources there, but most of it we will still try to get from the private sector. And then lastly, if it's indeed, it is a priority for the government, but again, the private sector said no, even with de-risking or with changing in regulations, we are not gonna finance this project, then we can have a discussion with the government and say, yes, let's use World Bank resources or other MDB resources to finance this particular project. So that's a, a mentality change and a, 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 a change in incentives within the World Bank group on how we are approaching countries. Now, for obvi obviously, this is often a bit more successful, or will be maybe more successful initially middle income countries, but doesn't stop us from thinking about energy projects or road projects or bridge or port projects or airport projects in low income setting as well to bring the private sector there. Because if we are bringing the private sector there, we have these other low resources from IDA, for example, to do other projects in a country. If we are using, so the whole issue is how are we gonna crowd in or are we crowding out the private sector? So the question and the mentality shift that we want to accomplish within the World Bank is that we are really gonna crowd in private sector instead of crowding out private sector. Because infrastructure projects are the easy ones to do. Another one is in the, in the billions to trillions paper, if I might still call it like that, although I like to call it billions for trillions. There was also a lot of discussion about how are we gonna deal with global public goods or global public bets. Yeah. These are the issues around pandemics, these are the issues around climate change, these are the issues around famine. And there also what we said is, okay, we need maybe to look at this much more from an insurance perspective. Why don't we try to develop an insurance market for pandemics? Why don't we try to develop an insurance market for famine? Why don't we sit down with the private insurers, and we did for pandemic, we did already, and we worked with Swiss reinsurance, Munich reinsurance, and basically the great thing there also is that the private sector comes in, yeah, they look at how we normally approach these type of, uh, of projects, and they put a lot of discipline on top of us, because the private sector, the insurance company, will not write a contract with us on, on pandemics like Ebola or on famine if there is not a decent return to be made and if it's not viable within the long term. Yeah. So these are two of the examples I would like to bring. A is the cascade, that's really at the country level. Every country we are being asked to look at is there a possibility to bring the private sector in. And the second one is really about global public goods to work also much more with the private sector, particularly in these global public bets, to bring in insurance companies to help us model and to ensure that uh, in the end we have resources available for countries that get hit by pandemics and famine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Gail, if you would like to provide your perspective, I think you're coming probably from a private sector perspective, perhaps. Yeah, hi. Um, so, first of all, hi everyone. I walked in the back and I thought, gee, I wonder where I am. It felt like a 
kind of energy sapping room. So <laughs> if I could just for a moment ask you all to stretch, it would be good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I was thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to come to it right now, but I was thinking, um, I, I work quite a lot with young entrepreneurs all around the world uh, who are trying to come up with great solutions for the SDGs. And I was thinking, uh, I would have loved them to be here trying to answer this, these questions because, um, you know, we should adopt some of that, I think, in the way, our way of being. So... Enough of that to try and get some energy going. So what is my view on, um, what is my view on where's the money and what's happening? So first of all, I guess, you know, there are $220 trillion of funds under management in the world. Huge amount of money out there. Um, it's not our money, as one of my uh, colleagues said to me, it's actually our money. So. Pension funds have 17% of it, insurance companies 9% of it, banks 38% of it, private equity 1% of it, asset wealth managers 31.5% of it, and sovereign wealth funds 3.5% of it. Lots and lots of money. <laughs> I guess the real question is, um, how is it being used and who's telling all of these people how to use it? So my background, uh, I was with Unilever for my whole life almost. I ran Unilever in Africa uh, and then the global savory business, global laundry business. I was chief sustainability officer. I then went to Old Mutual, which is a financial services business, to try and understand how money moves. Um, but all the way through, my belief was that business needs to serve society because only businesses that serve society actually have a role to play. And that was why I did what I did and why I do what I do now, which is trying to make the case around um, a proper economic case, around the reason why the SDGs are so important. So we've got 220 trillion. How do we get that flowing behind the SDGs? Well, the good thing, one of my little projects at the moment has been looking at this idea of blended finance. And uh, I'm going to hold up this little report. You guys can go online and find it. But all it does is really try and understand what's happening. And I'm going to use an example I used at lunchtime today, which is it feels like instead of us all playing a relay race to win at the end of the day, we're all playing different games. So the international finance institutions, the MDBs, the national governments, the private sector, the pension, are all playing different games. If we could at least align some of that around achieving what it is we need to achieve for the SDGs, suddenly we have a whole rush of possibility. And so this little report, all it does is try to speak about, and I was delighted to meet you also, I haven't met you before, but delighted to hear about the cascade approach and the idea of mobilizing capital for, uh, private capital. Because quite simply, there's a problem. The problem is that pension funds, and most of us, I think, have our pensions in a pension fund, and I'd ask you, where is your money going? Do you know? Right? Pension funds can't just put their money wherever they fancy it to go because they have to look after your future and my future. And so they are risk averse. They try to go to places where they are sure that they're going to be safeguarded and they're going to be flows at least for 20 or 30 years in the future. Insurance companies, you know, I've been involved in insurance too. Insurance companies have exactly the same issue. They have to underwrite based on the risks that they can understand. And then if you have a look at banks, and I'm not going to talk about, you know, the greedy bankers. I'm going to talk about banks that are safeguarding our money. Similarly, banks have to underwrite projects where they can understand the risk and they can understand the returns. 
So where we are all in, I guess I'd call it the, the world that cares about the SDGs, thinking about how we crowd in finance, we really need to start thinking in financial terms. How do we stop thinking about the finance guys as the bad guys and the development guys as the good guys, but start thinking about how together we can run a relay race to be able to solve the problem. Now, can I add one last thing? I want to talk about the importance of women very quickly, right? Because everywhere I go, I try and understand how many women leaders are driving for the changes we need. And uh, similarly to the blended finance report, we've also published a report on the importance of women leaders leading for the global goals, simply because we know that, and I'll, I'll reel off some statistics at some point if anyone's interested, but we know that when more women are leading to make the decisions that need to be made, very often there's a broader consideration set that comes in. And so talking about the levers for the SDGs. Innovation is one, finance flowing the right way is another, and we believe that more gender-balanced leadership is another one. I'm done. Thank you very much. So keeping with the relay theme, um, I'm going to turn to Joss. So um, Gail, you mentioned around the 200 million, which is under, man under management, and I mentioned earlier about the 200 trillion, sorry, assets under management of our institutional investors and, and then the investment in the negative yielding assets. So this is where I'm going to come to Jossen and to, and to the EIB, Matteo. What's the role of the IFIs then? How can the IFIs help in tapping this institutional investments? What, what's your role? How can you help us uh, tap this? Um, and so I put that question to you, Joss. Well, one thing I think I said already, that this whole cascade approach by asking yourself all the time together with government officials who are supposedly borrowing from us, if it's really worthwhile to take the money from us or if they care better off taking the money from the private sector because the money then that comes from us can be used for sectors and purposes that currently no private sector really wants to go. And that's still often in, uh, in, in social sectors like health, education or, or social transfers. So that's one thing. I think the second thing is really our institution is very, basically our business model is pre preparing and implementing projects. So I think what we have to do, and even more than in the past, is really helping countries, developing countries, our client countries, to help prepare and prepare projects in such a way that actually they can be provided or shown to the private sector and get their interest to finance them and implement. So I think that's in a, I would, uh, and then, of course, also, I think, related to that, is that we need to really help governments also to see what are the risks of engaging with the private sector. It's one, we should not think that, it's a, that this is like, you know, the, the holy grail to uh, the getting better development outcomes. There are many stories out there by which private, pub, uh, sorry, public-private partnership didn't do very well or didn't go very well. And I think the risk sharing within these public-private partnerships uh, because that's in a sense what you do when you bring the private sector in to help you finance uh, development. We need to understand very well, and I think government officials need to understand very well, and uh, the private investor who comes in needs to understand it very well, is who, who carries the risks and for what. Because we have gone through a debt crisis, and it was really not a pleasant one in the mid-90s, uh, under developing countries, and we really don't want to end there again. So we need to go in with our eyes wide open and not eyes wide shut. We need to be open that A, we prepare proper projects and we help the countries prepare for the projects and B, we help them really evaluate what type of uh, contracts they get into when they sign uh, this type of public-private partnerships. So do you see any role in terms of leverage then and financial instruments? I mean, you've spoken around, if you like, the enabling environment and, and the preparation side of things. How about, you know, utilising the, the balance sheets and, and the kind of blended finance? So yeah. instruments... No, exactly, absolutely, but that's in a sense, for me, it's very much the cascade approach. And I, I have some other ideas on innovative financing that we might talk about a bit later, but I think the cascade approach is really the first thing to leverage our balance sheet, and is to leverage the resources from the private sector to the government. 
Okay, so we, we might hear a bit more. Um, Mathieu, would you yeah. like to comment on this? No, just, just to say that what Gail said is really, uh, you know, at the core of how we can, as uh, IFIs, we can help in, in, in becoming a, a conduit of, uh, you know, transferring this huge amount of money that is uh, under management and often uh, with negative interest in the current uh, financial environment. Uh, uh, and, and bring it towards uh, the, the, uh, the usage for SDGs. Uh, you know, financial sector is, uh, is uh, or capital markets, uh, are, is a very simple word. They want to have, uh, you know, you know the, the major principle are, you know, credibility, reliability of the partners. When you are uh, in a reinsurance company, when you are a, a wealth fund, you indeed want to have a long-term investment where to put your money, but you want to be sure that uh, you don't lose your money. You want to be sure that on the other side there is someone that goes for some investments that are safe, that are, that are sound enough not to, not to go bankrupt. And here the role of uh, the IB, the role of other IFIs is crucial because uh, uh, you know, every year the AB goes into the, to the capital markets to, to ask for around 80 billion to, to, to the institutional investors around the world. And uh, to do so, we need to maintain our, our capital very well balanced, very, uh, very well managed. We need to maintain our AAA rating. Because otherwise, we will not get this money. And this is where we can become a conduit, you know, because to, this is the way we can use, we can tap these funds and, and to use them for, for sound projects. Sound projects, as you said, is, uh, is another key role uh, for, for us, for IFIs. We need to make sure that the projects, as I said before, are well prepared, well maintained, and so on and so forth. And when we do so, we also have the opportunity to bring in other in in private sector investments. We've seen, for example, or in, in, certain, in, in the Western Balkans, but not only, that whenever we enter, even with a small stake into a project, this is considered to be a label of good quality from banks or other long-term investors to put their own money into the same project. So if you like, on one side, we're getting this money from the, let's say, asset management world into the SDG project. On the other side, we make sure that when we finance a project, there are other investors that join the investments. Thank you for that. Um, coming back to you, Gail, then. So, Flair, um to the report that was issued and is going to be um, launched at the spring meetings, what does the Business Commission think that the IFIs need to do differently? What are your key recommendations? And then perhaps so we can have some, some responses uh, to that. Okay, so um, there were six recommendations, which I'm, uh, I'm not going to cover in detail. I guess, uh, I guess the, the most important uh, point for the IFIs is, I guess, the relay race, okay? Understanding that each of us has a role to play in driving things forward. So, if you are an asset or wealth manager that is sitting on 32% of the 200 trillion, you need to speak to your wealth managers, and trust me, I've been in the wealth management, it's not that easy. <laughs> you need to speak to them and help them to understand the opportunity that's out there, that they shouldn't really only look at an S&P 500, have a look at what's out there that's possible, go off to the easy pickings. They need to really have a look at what they should put in their mandate that could be new growth opportunities that are linked to the SDGs. If you look at... Um, at the MDBs, you know, we've been speaking about mobilization ratios, and uh, I'm not going to mention what the numbers are because they all seem to be all over the place. But, you know, is mobilization ratio a critical incentive for what the MDBs are actually trying to deliver on the ground? I know that when you speak to some of the private sector, they will say, we actually can't find bankable projects because MDBs on the ground are incentivized to deliver projects, and so they basically bundle them up, take them themselves, <laughs> and then there's nothing left for the private uh, sector. So there's something about mobilization ratios. Um, and then for pension funds, I actually think they're moving quite fast. So pension funds, 
are moving quite fast in terms of um, removing the um, most negative elements in terms of future deliverables from their portfolios, haven't yet found a way to talk about how you should bring in riskier SDG-linked investments. And I think that's what we all have to help them to do. Um, and then there's something around projects, right? So um, I don't know if we'll have time to talk about this, but you know, I, I particularly wanted to mention the um, Turkish hospital bond that I think is one of the case studies we, we raise in the report because it's an example of a blended finance vehicle that really delivered something quite uh, special with ELBD providing the liquidity facility, um, World Bank providing the political risk insurance, Moody's then being able to give a much higher um, rating, so what we call piercing the sovereign ceiling, and suddenly you have a, had a project that was highly investable and everyone interested in it. I'm personally working right now on something around special economic zones, one in Nigeria, one in Mozambique, maybe one in Trieste, which, we, which I need to talk to my friend Bateva. So the idea of finding projects that are really interesting because they'll move forward the SDG agenda, but they're going to need different financing solutions. Um, so how can we get the players in the relay race together to think about them? So I think that's what the blended finance report says. Everyone figure out what your role is in the relay and play it. Great, thank you very much. Um, just quickly, just in, light, in the spirit of the conversation, I mean, um, Jos and Matteo, do you have any reflection on that in terms of the mobilization kind of ratios and changes to business models and incentives, which perhaps that's pointing, pointing to? Just some very brief kind of reactions to that, please. Well, just uh, I let um, the, the numbers speak for the, a couple of initiatives that we have uh, carried out. One you may be aware of, when the President of the Commission, European Commission, Juncker, started his office, he said we need to have, uh, by 2018, uh, 30, 30, 315 billion new investments being carried out in Europe. This was his stimulus, if you, if you like, uh, from a political uh, side uh, uh, during his commission. And how are we gonna do it? Uh, he said, we're gonna put, we're gonna give the European Investment Bank 16 mil billion of euro of the taxpayers' money. What we've done, uh, we've taken this 16 billion euro, we have added another 5 billion euro uh, to it, and we have put together a, a, a first loss piece, a guarantee uh, for our investment uh, that uh, amounted to 21 billion euro. And uh, because of this guarantee, we actually could step up our investments because our balance sheet was covered enough by this guarantee. So our AAA was not put at stake. And we have managed to develop uh, an investment plan that at the end of uh, 2017, uh, contributed for 257 euro, billion euro of investment carried out. The beauty of it, however, is that uh, the EIB money into this 250 billion euro, or more than this, was only 51. So all the rest came from the private sector, because what we did with this guarantee, we actually undertook the riskier part of the of the investment, and we let the, you know, the, the, the senior investor looking for safer uh, type of investments take the, the most comfortable uh, part of the investment. Okay, thank you. Jos? Yeah. Yeah, very quickly, I think the, the, you call about the relay race or you call about, you talk about the cascade. I think it's converging, yeah? It's, it's where do we find the role for one another? And I think we will probably have to have some more discussions with uh, particular, I think, with the long-term private investors like pension funds and insurance companies to see how do we better connect with them to bring them on board and, uh, and, and deal with them. The thing about issues around uh, uh, mobilization or, you know, the, the, 
in my, in my institution, when I was myself a, a task, what we call task team leader, the, be, the, the, the one most wonderful thing and most thing you looked up to was going to the board with your project. Yeah? And you would get a reward, basically, or a promotion, or saying this was really important if you go to the board. I think that mentality also is in the bank has to change. You can only, in a sense, be really rewarded going with a project to the board if you mobilize private resources. It's simple as that. I mean, these type of reward systems are changing, and I think, I don't want to use, you know, the cascade is not an answer to everything, because it isn't, but it certainly helps to drive through mentality change and incentives within the organization to align ourselves much better with what resources are out there from the private sector and try to bring them to development. Great, thank you. Um, coming to you, Matteo, now, because um, um, just reflecting on your portfolio, which you look after in, in the Balkans, if you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you're facing in terms of financing um, invest infrastructure investment projects in, in your region. Uh, just again, to give, uh, to give an idea about the activity of the EIB in the Western Balkans, in the six uh, Western Balkan countries, over the last 10 years, we have uh, lent uh, about uh, uh, 7 billion euro. Um, recently, in the aftermath of the refugee crisis uh, uh, that uh, hit the Western Balkan route, uh, we were asked to step up our efforts through the so-called Economic Resilience Initiative, which will allow us to do more private sector uh, um, uh, funding and, uh, and leveraging. Um, we finance infrastructure. Our portfolio is composed of infrastructure uh, projects, particularly in, in, in the transport sector, but also in energy and, uh, and social sectors, as well as SMEs uh, through commercial banks or national promotional banks. I think if I have to point at one challenge is, let me go back to what I, I mentioned earlier, is, uh, or the most urgent priority uh, is uh, rule of law. Um, I think uh, we, I was discussing with a, with a colleague earlier uh, from UNDP, um, this time around, uh, given the enlargement strategy that was adopted by the Commission in February this year for the Western Balkans, is uh, either now or never to, take the to, 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 to seize the opportunity to change things and to make public administration more efficient and more effective and to have uh, uh, a rule of law strengthened in these countries. Rule of law is a big principle, but you need to spell it out in, in various uh, very simple uh, things, such as uh, uh, a decrease of political influence uh, over the technical decisions on investments, uh, an, in, a, an increase of professionalism in public administration, uh, uh, an increase of empowerment uh, of the local institutions and capacity of local institutions. Let me conclude with one example of which we are very proud at the, at the bank. Um, the public procurement laws in, the, every of the, in each and every one of the six Western Balkan countries says then that when there is an investment project that is financed by an IFI, the procurement complaints need to be uh, tackled uh, by the international financial institution that uh, is financing the project. In other words, you are bidding for, uh, for constructing a motorway, uh, you are not happy with the transparency of the process of the procurement, you complain, you are not allowed to go to Serbian first instance authority to complain about, you need to go to World Bank, you need to go to EBRD or whatever. We said that uh, this is no more the case. We went to the parliament together with the Serbian authorities, the Serbian parliament, and for, from now on, all our 17 active operations, whatever complaint is happening on projects financed by the IB, is to be dealt by the, Co Republic Commission, the Serbian Republic Commission on Procurement. This is the way to empower further the local authorities. This is a way to make sure that uh, increased professionalism is happening in the country and uh, even IFIs, multilateral, are stepping back from helping them on each and every inch of their processes. Okay, thank you. Um, as I say, we're talking quite a lot about kind of um, the assets under management and redirecting and incentivizing uh, different investment flows. But I think quite often that's, we're talking around the hard sectors of the economy and things. So, but 
what do we think about private finance and, if you like, the social sectors? Um, and I know that, that you focus on this and your institution focuses exclusively on this. So do you have any reflections kind of on, on this issue around private finance and, and social impact investment? Thanks. I have, and I'm sorry if I will repeat some of the challenges already mentioned by uh, my colleagues here. Uh, what we see at the CEB that there is a gap, a large gap in Europe between the needs for social infrastructure investments and the money actually mobilized for that purpose. And this gap has even widened since the financial crisis. For example, I can give you one figure. In the EU, we estimate the gap to be 100, 150 billion per year this means a total gap of 1.5 trillion for social infrastructure investment over the period 2018-2030. Um, I, I know we, have, we don't have a lot of time, but I want to focus on some of the important uh, things. So if we, I want to focus on the financing side of uh, social infrastructure, we are talking about small and mainly public investments. Small compared to major economic infrastructure, we were talking about toll roads, airports. Public investment because responsibility for social infrastructure investment mainly lies with local and regional authorities in Europe. We are also talking about investment which is often financially unattractive to long-term investors because the impact, the economic and social, mainly social impact, is difficult to assess over the long-term horizon. But this doesn't mean that we cannot attract private finance. Having said that, what we need in Europe is to boost both public and private investment. Uh, let me see. And to achieve this, we need major changes and new initiatives to increase the size of investment and to implement innovation in this investment. First of all, Matteo already mentioned, we need to increase the pipeline of a good, technically and financially viable project for social infrastructure. And here, in this respect, we need to build capacity at national and local level. Second, we need to promote new financial instruments specifically dedicated to social infrastructure, such as social bonds. I already mentioned our social inclusion bond. And third, I'm repeating what my colleague said, we need a stable or more investment-friendly regulatory environment with, for example, favorable taxation and incentive schemes for social investment. Okay, thank you. I think I think we started late. So I wonder if can I go to the floor and, and open the open up? Because I think we started uh, slightly late. So uh, uh, okay. So um, I'm going to open um, the floor up. So if we have any questions, please uh, pop your head up. If there's anything coming in online. None at all, and we have none from Twitter either at the moment. Um, okay, right. Um, well, maybe can I just then finish the session just by Absolutely. quickly? Absolutely. Just by um, asking the panel, just quickly, maybe uh, to Gail and, and Lucia, what do you think then are the two kind of just, I don't know, very, very quickly, the two top changes that are needed and the actions required? I can answer this question on two different levels. At institutional level, as the CEB, the top two changes we need to make concern first how we can mainstream SDGs in all our activities. And the second one is how we can then measure our contribution to SDGs. And the second level is the global level, and this is why we are all here together today, is how we can work together, how we can collaborate, develop our partnerships, we did with which we can work. Um, so the, I guess the first thing would be to have these conversations 
more frequently, but in the light of very particular projects or challenges. Some, something that really concerns me, which is why I, I guess I made that flippant remark in the beginning, is that many of the people that are trying to solve these things are so far removed from where the real issues are that we actually are trying to set policies and without any concept of what's going on on the ground. And so I'm a great believer in moving forward by solving a problem. And so for us, you know, whoever it might be and whoever you might be, to think about what it is you want to solve and what you need finance to do about it, um, and then pull the right people together and try and solve it, I think is quite frankly, far more useful than sitting in more conferences. That's my personal point of view. That's the first point. And the second would be, um, I guess quite simply, get more women in leadership. I second that. Um, and then over to Yossa Mathieu. What do you think are the most promising financial tools, tools? to close the, or to crowd in this investment? Uh, just very short, what do you think are the, what should the IFIs be looking into? No, just uh, just to, <clears throat> to, do, uh, to do more with less. I mean, this is, uh, we're not making miracles, uh, although bankers sometimes uh, they, 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 they try, but uh, the example I made with the Juncker plan uh, is replicated with the external lending mandate we have, another guarantee whereby for one euro of the taxpayer money in uh, DIB, there is uh, 25 euro of investment. Again, there is no, there is no miracle behind, there is simple statistical uh, calculation of the risk uh, over a portfolio for which a guarantee is provided by taxpayer's money, and this allows the, the, the bank to invest more towards uh, the objective of, uh, of the, SD, to the attainment of the SDGs. We do have one from Twitter. How can we move beyond narrow investment in women's empowerment for gender equality? And I guess, Gail, I think only you can kick this one off, <laughs> if I may say so. Oh, you were still on the other one. Okay, I can comment on the gender one as well. I Indeed. Think in our institution is very clear. You have to. Our gender equality is good economics, period. I mean, and more women in leadership is a clear commitment that our senior management is, uh, is following through. Uh, so that's certainly happening. I think of our CEOs, we have four CEOs in our organization, five, because we have these five bodies, and three of them are, are female. Yeah. So I think on that front, we, we, we're trying to walk the talk as much as we can. On financial, I think we, I think there's a realization in, in, the, in, I think in the World Bank and probably else as well, is that the cascade is quite a trans, the cascade approach that I've been trying to explain to you is a very transaction intensive type of approach, and actually that maybe it, it's it's good to bring local investors, financial investors uh, around the table and get them interested in in financing development, but that maybe that if we want to engage really internationally with uh, insurance companies with pension funds, that we much more maybe have to go also to a sort of an exposed approach by which we have projects already implemented and we sell the loans that we have on our balance sheets to these investors. Yeah. So the bank, multilateral development banks are quite good in preparing and implementing projects. So keep on doing that or get an extra resources through a capital increase or through additional private resources to pre prepare and implement projects. And once they're implemented, Normally, within the World Bank, our loans are 15 to 35 years, and they're sitting not completely idle on our balance sheet, because we still go to capital markets uh, uh, and try to get resources from them. But these type of resources, these type of assets, we could actually sell to, uh, to uh, long-term uh, financial institutions, such as uh, insurance uh, companies and pension funds. So that's a sort of a complement, uh, which maybe will come around uh, over the next few years to the cascade approach. Thank you. I know the G20 on the, the focus on infrastructure investment has tasked the World Bank Group to look at those kind of issues. So finally, maybe, um, Gail, would you like to comment on the, on the gender? Sure. I didn't want to hijack the panel with it. Um, <laughs> the, 
So it's quite simple. If we say the SDGs are um, a potential investment opportunity of 12 trillion, so investment opportunity, new growth, okay, new growth beyond what could be there, 12 trillion. And, and if you haven't seen anything about the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, I encourage you to go and have a look. We're closed now, but go and have a look at the website. There's all sorts of really interesting stuff there. Right. But the gender, so gender inclusion in economic development is worth double that. And I think this is a figure from the World Bank. 28 trillion opportunity if we get more women engaged in economic activity. So I don't, the, the question was, how can we go beyond empowerment? I don't see anything to do with, I don't think anything about genders to do with empowerment. It's around how do we get more women engaged in economically active opportunities? Because that changes everything. And we can start from education to small businesses to large businesses to, you know, head of whatever. And then not to do purely a woman exclusion gender thing. It's about gender balanced teams because diverse teams, wherever you are, and we can do this across all sorts of other things, including, you know, religions and but gender balanced teams create completely different results. And I think, again, I'd encourage you to have a look at some of the work that's been put out by the Business Commission because you'll find it very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps we should have a, another panel on that at some point. Um, okay, so I'd just like to thank the panel. I just wanted to, I mean, it's quite difficult to summarise, but I think I've taken away three key points. One is about, it's a system, holistic system, with lots of different players who have different comparative advantages. And actually, we need to be very clear on those comparative advantages. Um, and I like the concept of the relay race, so kind of singing from the same hymn sheet, and that there are changes required across the board. Um, the importance of new approaches, so the, I enjoyed listening about the cascade of, um, approach and how that's driving change in the institution in terms of incentives. Um, and I've also think we've heard around the power of new instruments and thinking creatively. So the power of blending, for example, the EIB example, there, the, the Turkish hospital there, on the social um, impact bonds or investment bonds. Social inclusion bonds, sorry. Um, so anyway, without further ado, I think we've well overrun um, our... But only slightly, I think we started quite late. No, we started late. Okay. All, all I good. To, all I want good. to thank the panel very much. And um, yes, for that, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for coffee. And I urge you to come back in 30 minutes because we will have... We'll be crossing live to Detroit to hear our final and our keynote speech. So see you in 30 minutes after your coffee. Bye-bye for now.